Welcome to the Roundup, the Cloud Roundup with Bo Bullock as your as your chairman. Hey everyone. <laughs> we appreciate Exciting. that. And the rest of on the rest of the team, for those of you who who don't uh, recognize our new person, uh, Megan Lucia is the innkeeper at Wild West Hacking Fest and Anti Siphon Training, and we are welcoming welcoming her. You'll start to see Megan more and more as you have customer service issues. She is a director of our customer service. She'll also be working in Cyber Range with the the Ranger. So um, really excited excited to have Megan on board. Ralph Mays is also one of uh, the pin testers over at BHIS. So we're glad to have him join us this morning. And of course, who doesn't know the Outback Joffrey? <laughs> Am I uh, unmuted? I don't know. I hope you are. Yeah, we I heard you. you. <laughs> we um, can hear you. And then, of course, we have Mr. Ryan, the shootist, uh, who's who's joined us today me. too. So, welcome everybody. Anyway. Well, good times. Hey, this I was really excited by this event. You know, I was funny. I was talking to Bo earlier this week. I was like, "Hey, I got some cloud stuff, man. I need to do this and this and this." He goes, "You are coming to my event, right?" <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, there's that thing going on. So I'm hoping to learn some things today. Unfortunately, I have a meeting kind of right in the middle of this, which is actually really annoying. But, you know, stuff happens. Uh, (laughs) But um, no, what great stuff, right? I mean, everything is everything is cloud right today. I mean, we know that 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 cloud maturity just continues skyrocketing on this upward trajectory trajectory. And it's. um, you know, we're 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 rising to meet that need as pen testers, security professionals, to to understand what those new challenges are, to talk about the defensive weaknesses and misconfiguration weaknesses, to talk about the offensive side of exploiting those. And I think Bo is just gonna. Well, I know that Bo is gonna have a great time today talking oh, about absolutely. <laughs> lots of good stuff. So yeah, yeah, no, just, give me a good day. This- the speakers we got lined up are, are amazing. I mean, it's going to be such a great day of, of cloud pen testing talk across the board from Azure to AWS. It's going to be really, really awesome. Really excited about it. <laughs> um, so who's going to intro Dirk? I guess that's over to Bo. Go that's for it, me. Bo. <laughs> Dirk Jan, welcome. Thank you. Awesome to have you Glad here. To be here. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm so excited to have you on. I, I actually mentioned you in my class multiple times because of the research you do. You put out so much amazing research in the cloud security space, and I am like just so stoked to have you on today. It's going to be amazing. I hope so. So, so I guess uh, we've, we've, we can go ahead and intro you and get you ready to go here. So Dirk Jan Malima is uh, one of the core researchers of Active Directory and Azure AD at Fox IT. Amongst the open source tools published to advance the state of Azure AD research are Road Tools, ACL Pwn, Curb Relay X, Man in the Middle 6, and a Python port of Bloodhound. It's actually funny, uh, Joff and I were literally just using Road Tools like two days ago, and uh, <laughs> it's amazing. It's, it's so good. We were, um, we were testing an organization that they actually disabled uh, access to the Azure portal directly. So, you know, logging into the portal, you couldn't actually see anything. So we used road tools to 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 get the graphic access we needed to kind of go through all the settings and stuff. Yeah, so that, well, that's the whole reason I wrote it. It just annoyed me that they 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 disallow access to the Azure portal. So I'm like, well, then I'll write my own portal because the exactly. data is there. <laughs> yeah, I, but yeah, I just want to say thank you, by the way, because it did yield a lot of interesting data for me and and allowed me to go through some stuff. So winning right just this week and if, if Bo hadn't known about that i'd have been like oh, i don't know what to do so much much appreciate that uh, contribution yeah, so welcome. um yeah so dirk chan blogs at dirkchanm.io where he publishes about new active directory attack chains which included the discovery of the priv exchange vulnerability he's also the co-author of ntlm relay x and contributor to sev- several other open source tools and libraries he is presented at troopers defcon black hat blue hat and was part of the MSRC Most Valuable Researchers from 2018 to 2020 through his Azure AD research. So without further ado, um, Dirk Chan is going to talk about fantastic conditional access policies and how to bypass them. Welcome, Dirk Chan. Everyone give him a big welcome. (laughs) 
Um, today we're going to talk about fantastic, fantastic additional access policies and how to bypass them. Just want to stay a few more seconds on this slide to look at the nice logo. I always wanted to make a horrible pun. Uh, I haven't actually watched the Harry Potter movies, but I just like this. Uh, <laughs> this pun. So there you go. Now you're all victim to it. All right. So the short, who am I? Bo already introduced me, so I'll skip all of that. It's basically the same. Um, I'm from the Netherlands. Um, I do research, I blog, I have a Twitter, um, and all the other things that he said. So I need to go to the main content. Um, I have quite some slides today, so um, I hope we'll have enough time to go through all of them. But I really want to talk about Azure AD and conditional access policies. So we're going to start with what are conditional access policies, and then move on to some basic policies and have some words about multi-factor authentication. Moving into enumerating policies and how you can actually see which policies are there in the environment. And then going into the slightly more advanced, so primary refresh tokens and what you can do with those and end up with device compliancy and all these kind of um, advanced new things that are in Azure AD. Starting with disappointing you all, uh, this talk is not about any lead hack zero days bypasses. This is all, this is just looking at how do conditional access policies work. And of course, there are always some, some limits and some ways that don't actually um, move into these policies. But that's not the focus of this talk. This is really like, how are they designed? How do they work? And what are the limits? And by understanding the limits of these policies, both red and blue can uh, improve their game and hopefully make the... Uh, improve security for everyone and make it a bit of a safer place. So starting with some terminology, I think this is always confusing for people because they talk about Azure. And then the first thing I ask them like, okay, which Azure? Because there's so much in Azure, it's so large. And uh, in this talk, we're really going to focus on Azure AD, so Azure Active Directory. And Azure Active Directory is the identity platform in Azure, and it's used for Office 365 but also as an identity platform for the Azure Resource Manager. So that's where all your virtual machines and other infrastructure live and all the other Azure things. And you can also use this to, uh, as an identity platform for any of your own applications or third-party applications. So you can, you can have a software subscription somewhere and then sign in with your Azure AD account. So this is not about infrastructure, virtual machines, virtual other things and, uh, and stuff. It's really about Azure AD and identity. So the basics, what are conditional access policies? The really short version is that conditional access policies define who can access what and from where, and what are the requirements that they need to satisfy to be able to log in or to view a certain piece of data. And this kind of evolved from from the binary setting, um, either your account has MFA or it doesn't have MFA and you need MFA everywhere switch. So this is really more granular and you can have exceptions, but you can also go way beyond only requiring MFA. I think it's really the most important Azure AD security feature. No, not every organization is using it yet, but it's starting to evolve. And uh, as cloud adoption uh, hugely increases here, I think it's important that everyone knows what they are and really start using them because they're very powerful tools. I also think that they will play a more important role in the next few years. So a few examples, things are going to be very simple. So a condition access callers policy could be that any member of the group needs MFA, has to use MFA to sign in. You could also say that anyone who is a manager, so it's a member of group manager or a certain set of users, can only sign in from a compliant Windows 10 device. And you can also say, OK, so users are not allowed to sign in from Android. These are all different possible policies. And each policy can apply to um, a certain condition or to a certain sign-in. And they're all evaluated in turn when you sign in to Azure AD. Let's start with the basics and um, have a talk about multi-factor authentication. As we all know, uh, multi-factor authentication is very important. And uh, we've heard a lot of, uh, of about MFA the, the, in the last few years. 
but it's simply because people aren't really enabling it yet. So there's still so many people out there that 99% of all attacks could actually be blocked with multi-factor authentication. Of course, I really agree with that multi-factor authentication is important, but there's a side note. So the thing I wanted to add here is this. So not 99.9% of all current attacks could be blocked with multi-factor authentication. And um, that's it's really great. So at this moment, if you enable it, uh, you're probably quite safe from those 99.9% .9 of attacks. But uh, things will develop further, attackers will develop further, and it's going to be enough in the future. And this is really down to attacker economics. And because I'm a Dutch person, and in the Netherlands we have a lot of bikes, I like to compare it with bikes. So the thing is, a lot of people have bikes, and there's also a lot of bikes get stolen. Now, some of the basic rules, if you put your bike somewhere, if you don't lock it, well, obviously a high chance it gets stolen. If you do lock it, then uh, there's less chance that it gets stolen, especially if your bike is a very old one or uh, no one cares about it. And in the end, you only have to lock your bike better than the bike next to it, because an attacker will always go for the bike with the least locks on it or the least effort to, to take away. So really translates well to um, to broader attacks actually so if you have a very shiny bike like an electric one which maybe costs you uh, 2k to buy then you need to put a lot of locks on it to to make sure that it's not stolen anyway even if there are a lot of older low value bikes out there and it also translates to public cloud security so if you're a very big company and there's a lot of value to gain by breaching your cloud you naturally have to have a higher standard of security than, co than companies that, are, that have lower value for an attack. So if we translate this to public cloud, so the attacks we see right now, which is a lot of business email compromise, they usually always start with password spraying. Uh, why is that? Because it's very low cost, and you don't have to put, hardly to have to put any effort in it, and it scales great. You just throw uh, passwords against thousands of accounts, um, multiple companies at the same time, and eventually you get in, and it's it's very easy. And the attackers don't necessarily care which company because well, every company has has something to gain. So if you enable MFA, this adds effort or cost for the attacker because they have they have to also bypass that, or they have to make sure that they also um, find methods to bypass that, or they have to actually fish for MFA as well, which is. Well, they're not going to bother as long as there are organizations without MFA and the return on investment is high enough for them there. So as long as that's true, yes, most attacks will be blocked with MFA, but uh, it's not necessarily that it means that once you put MFA on something, then everything's secure. So that raises the question, is MFA the magic solution? Uh, and I think MFA is one part of the protection. It's not certainly going to solve everything. We, we've seen frameworks like Evil Nginx, which show you that attackers can easily fish for MFA, for example, uh, while they're fishing for credentials. And um, eventually, uh, attacks will evolve beyond credential stuffing, and uh, then MFA won't be sufficient anymore. This doesn't mean that MFA is important. If you don't have MFA yet, I would almost say that it's, that it's equal to locking your bike with a very, very cheap lock because passwords usually suck. So if you do not have MFA enabled, please do that. But know that in the coming years, uh, I'm not sure it's going to be enough to, uh, to stop the ever evolving attacks. So there are basically two general ways to set MFA. You can configure MFA per user, or you can set it via conditional access. And the per user MFA is really an all or nothing. You, you either have MFA enforced on a user or you don't have it enabled and they don't need to use MFA for anything. You can specify some IP ranges, for example, to exclude, but that's about it. If you use conditional access for MFA, then you can specify conditions. So it's a lot more granular and you don't necessarily need MFA for every application, but you might need MFA for some critical applications. And the first, um, the first one, the per user MFA, is uh, more the traditional way. And uh, it's actually not recommended to do that anymore. 
And Microsoft now recommends that you do use conditional access for this. So per user MFA. It's set in this, in this panel, uh, which is sometimes a bit hard to find. You have to Google for it. But here it just says per user and this user MFA tests you. Uh, it's set to enforced. So we know that this user requires MFA to sign in. And this is quite interesting because whenever you set a user MFA on a user this way, it creates an artifact. And the artifact is that um, it adds the, the user to the Microsoft Azure Active Auth and application. And it gives you uh, the, uh, the default role, which has as a description the Active Authentication Administrator. Does it mean you can administer anything? No, it doesn't. But this. This, this, if you have this role, it's still a very good indicator that this user has their user MFA enforced. So uh, what I'm showing here is Road Recon, uh, which is a tool that was already shortly mentioned at the beginning. It's, it's uh, the tool I wrote to enumerate all of this. If you see the applications role page and you filter on the active auth end, then you can actually see the users that have this per user MFA enabled. And you can query this as any authenticated user. So the short version, if you add a user the uh, MFA option, it gives them that active authentication administrator role. That role doesn't necessarily grant you any privileges. I'm not sure why it's called administrator, but it's, it just means that you have to use MFA to sign in. If you remove the role from that user, it does not remove the MFA requirements. Trust me, I tried. But this can be queried by any user, so it's a good indicator that an account has MFA uh, enforced. Now, if we look at the conditional access MFA, then um, on the left you see the default conditional access screen, and you can you can set all the uh, the the user that it applies to, the application that it applies to, and when or not it applies. So we'll be seeing a lot of that in this presentation. And uh, on the bottom you see that you can set the access control and the conditions. So on the right, we see that one of the conditions is to uh, require multi-factor authentication. So this is just an example. Now, if we talk about conditional access policies, the thing is really important to keep in mind is the best policy is the one that applies to all the clients and all the applications. You can set a lot of conditions about what something applies to, what something doesn't apply to, but if you start playing with that, it, it leaves ways for bypasses. So if you have a really strict conditional access policy, which doesn't have a lot of conditions, so it's more like an unconditional access policy, but that's, that's really most watertight that you can get. And if you find a bypass for that, I'm sure Microsoft's interested to know it. But if you start with doing all that kind of conditions, exceptions, then you may, may open the door for some bypasses. And I'm just in uh, this documented view here. So there's some examples here of exclusions. So first, you can set which device platforms a, a policy, for example, doesn't apply to. And um, what you can see here, there's a lot of options you can specify. And if you select one, then it won't apply to that platform. You can also specify that a policy doesn't apply to a specific location, which can be a set of IP ranges or a specific country. So it's really great if you want to, to enforce things for a certain country or for a certain trusted network. Now, these have all some drawbacks. So the thing is that the device platform, it's based on the user agent. And this is documented, so I'm not this is, this is something that's inherently based on this policy. But if you um, co configure it based on the device platform, and the policy on the left is something, it's a bit weird, and I'm doing it totally wrong. But I'm, let's say, OK, on any of these platforms, and these are all the possible platforms, I select the grant block access. So on any of these platforms, you can't actually sign into Azure which is a bit weird because these are all the platforms. Why would anyone do this? I have no idea, but I just wanted to play around with it to test. 
So if I set my user agent to macOS, as expected, I can't access it because the policy blocks the access. However, when I switch back my user agent to the default, I'm using Firefox on Linux. And Linux is not one of the supported operating systems, so it's actually not in that list. And it means that it just doesn't, it isn't matched by all of these devices that we, whose boxes we checked. So then we can sign in just fine. And we see also that when we look at the condition access policy logs, we actually see that the device platform was unrecognized or empty, and thus it didn't match on any of the configured uh, operating systems. So this really gives you a lot of opportunity for an attacker um, to change your device user agent and then try to see if the policy is bypassed uh, that way. So that's with the, um, the devices. A different one is the client apps condition. This is, this is a policy that applies to anything that's in Office 365. I really like this policy because you don't have to specify which application it is specifically, but you can just specify the whole of Office 365 in one go. And, and you can then select uh, which, which apps it applies to. So one of the things that you could do, for example, is that you make a policy which only applies to browsers. So you don't want people to sign in on Office 365 with their browser, because if they sign in with the browser, it might not be on a corporate device, for example, and you don't want that. So we uncheck the box mobile apps and desktop clients. And it only applies to the browser. So if I log in, oh, actually, this policy, I changed it. So it, on this policy, it, it didn't deny anything, but it's specified that I need MFA. So if I'm in the browser, I need MFA according to this policy. And just going forward. If I log in on my browser, I can see the MFA challenge and uh, they send a text message to my phone number. So that does trigger the MFA. So if I do it slightly differently and I pretend that I'm Microsoft Teams, which is a desktop app, then I can sign in with just my username and password because it just doesn't match the policy because the policy only applies to browsers. And if you have a desktop client, that's not a browser. So it bypasses this policy. And as you can see, I totally signed in with Microsoft Teams. It says it there on the left. It does say on the right that my user agent was Python requests, but still it's Microsoft Teams. And I accessed Office 365 Exchange Online. So it looks totally legit. And as you can see here, I can use the um, Outlook API to actually request the messages. So here you see that I send myself a message with test mail access. And the great thing about Microsoft Teams is that it has a lot of permissions. So it can uh, query, well, basically, if you use Microsoft Teams, you know all the data that you can access in there. And anyone that's signing in using your account name and is allowed to access it with the desktop app can also query these APIs to access all that information. So if you want to find some public applications uh, with predefined Office 365 permissions, you can actually query that in the database from Road Tools. And it's really important that it's a public client because in OAuth 2, if you have a non-public client, which can be, for example, a web application, and a web application normally has a server backend, so it's not a client that runs on your, on your desktop, for example, or from an untrusted location. But those clients have a secret, and they can only use their privileges if they use the secret. But something like Microsoft Teams, it's just an app on your desktop. And I mean, they could add a secret in there, but it would have to be in the app because it's your desktop and the app on your desktop accessing all those things. So the secret would have to be in that binary on your desktop, or they would have to proxy everything through a backend. And all these public applications, which are usually native apps or Android apps, iOS apps, these are all public clients because they reside in an untrusted environment. And quite some of those have default Office 65 permissions. 
So for none of the 65 apps, it's a bit different. There aren't really any default permissions because uh, Microsoft Teams doesn't have access to your custom company app or to a third-party app that you use. But there may still be some public apps that someone added the possibility to interact with a different app. Now, there's some interesting uh, corner case here, which is the application proxy. So for those who don't know what application proxy is, it's basically a way to put a classical web application that may be run on-prem in your network to expose that via Azure. And you can use that to, um, to integrate with Azure AD authentication so you can actually enforce uh, things like MFA requirements for your internal application and, and make it accessible externally at the same time. This is quite, this is quite nice. So we want to really protect this application. So we set the condition access policy on it that we need MFA to access this. So this policy applies to our app server, um, which is the proxied application. And we say that we need MFA. Of course, the application server is only accessed using a browser because it's, it's a web application. So you're not going to, you're not going to access it with the mobile app or desktop clients. And you're not going to access it with any legacy clients, so you would think. However, there is a somewhat weird corner case here. So it turns out that if you create an application, proxy application, there is a default API permission, which you can set on other applications to allow that other application to access the application proxy application for in a, on behalf of a user. So I, I think the use case here is if you have another application and that somehow needs to delegate access or access things in the web application that's proxied, then you can actually use this permission granted to a different application. The user sign, signs in on that different application and then they get that access. But this is present by default. So that also means that you can use this default permission and assign it to other apps. So there aren't any default permissions to do this. So no apps should have this permission, but the application proxy does expose the permission by itself. Now, if user consent to permissions is enabled, and this is not, not nowadays anymore a default, but I still wanted to highlight it, the user can actually grant permissions themselves to existing applications and access the application proxy. So we are going to use a public application to and grant that application privileges ourselves to access the application proxy. And that way we can eventually access it using a, um, using a mobile or desktop app. So just to show if we access this in the browser, it triggers MFA. As expected, uh, we set the policy for that. Now, we use some different thing, and it's called dynamic consent. So each application has a set of default permissions. And these permissions um, are set in the application manifest. But there's also a way to request new permissions dynamically. And if you request that new permission, then the use will be redirected to the um, permission screen and uh, once it's approved, then the application can use those new permissions. And if we have a public application, we can request them ourselves, provided that the user consent is enabled. And if that's the case, there's no admin approval required. So we go to this URL, and just to show this is the client ID for Microsoft Teams. So Microsoft Teams is in this case requesting access to access this application proxy server. And it's going to be redirected back to the, to the native client endpoints, which is ASUS default endpoint for desktop applications. So then we see this screen, and we see that Microsoft Teams would like to access the app server. Well, that sounds good. So we accept that, and then we get a return code. And a return code can be used by an application to obtain an access token. And for public applications, there's no secret involved. So you can just convert this access token. You can 
this code I mean to an access token directly. So a little bit of Python. This, this is just some default OAuth stuff. It uh, may look a bit confusing, but you basically say, okay, I am Microsoft Teams. Um, I'm going to access the app server. This is my code. This is my redirect. And then you get back an access token for Microsoft Teams accessing the app proxy server. We can inject that. So once we access the application server proxy, we inject an uh, authorization header, and then the proxy will automatically convert that to a uh, access cookie. And you see, we don't see the login screen, but we now see the gateway timeout. And the gateway timeout is because I don't actually have any applications running, but the access part succeeded. So here we can bypass this policy, uh, which normally would block the browser from accessing it without MFA. So this is a kind of a corner case. It requires a specific policy, and it requires user consent to be enabled. But I, I figured this technique out, and then was a bit disappointed. It wasn't some general super cool bypass, but it's a lot of token magic, and I just want to show the possibilities. Right. So we've seen some example policies. We've seen how you can bypass some policies. Now let's see how we can enumerate policies. So there are multiple ways to do this. From, for if you don't have access yet to a tenant, you can by, try to identify the, the bypass angles by just trying it. And this is a tool called MFA Sweep, actually made by Bo. You may know him. We saw him earlier, actually. And we, when we throw off this tool, we see that it can access quite a lot of things except for the browser. And that's exactly how we configured our policy because our policy only applied to browsers and not to any other clients. So this nicely shows you that you can access those, those portals with anything other than a browser. Now, so this is the well, kind of brute force way. What you can also do is if you have credentialed access, you can um, run road tools get your data, and then run the policies plugin. So um, this will produce a HTML file with all the policies nicely parsed. And then we will, for example, see this policy that's called MFA for Office. And we see who's included, who's excluded, and that it applies to Office 65, only two browsers, and that you need MFA. So this will show you all the policies. And this also works as any authenticated user. So with one set of credentials, you can query all of this. Here are some more examples. Not to go over that. Let's talk about primary refresh tokens. So to now we've really talked about MFA and policies, and already said shortly that MFA is nice, but it's, it's not the, the golden bullet. So let us assume that all the policies are perfect. MFA is required anywhere. Let's ignore the possibility to fish with MFA, and let's assume there's no uh, legacy authentication or any weird exceptions, and that we can't easily bypass these policies. So what do we do? So we kind of move back to the endpoint. So this is also what traditional red teams nowadays do for on-prem environments. You have to go to the endpoint first, and then you can actually go back to directory via the magic thing called single sign-on. A single sign-on is also a thing in Azure AD. So endpoints are considered kind of trusted, and they can be hybrid joins, joined to Azure AD, or registered in Azure AD. And once, that's, once the, one of these is true, then they get a special token, which allows for single sign-on, because uh, no one wants to enter credentials all the time. So there's also single sign-on for Azure AD. And this is all possible with the primary refresh token. So there's a cryptographic trust established between a device and Azure AD when it's joined or registered in Azure AD. A lot of crypto certificates exchanged, and using those cryptographic secrets, they can exchange a longer-lived single sign-on token, which is valid for 14 days by default, and that's called the primary refresh token. And the secrets belonging to this token are stored in the TPM if they're present. So how does this work? Well, basically, any application in the user session can request single sign-on to Azure AD. 
which is pretty the same as Active Directory. And this can be done via RPC or uh, via some helper applications, which is the way Chrome does it. And there are two blogs here. The first one is the RPC approach explained that was um, written up by uh, Lee Christensen. And the second one is uh, my own blog using the, the helper tool for Google Chrome to, um, to request these tokens. And I'll sh just show you this, uh, the second one. So what does Road Token do? So if you use um, the Road Recon authentication part, you can say, okay, I want to initialize a single sign-on flow. This is actually necessary only since a couple of months because they slightly changed how the primary refresh token works. So you have to initialize that and you get a nonce. And you also have to say which, which thing you want to access and which client application. And we're using Microsoft Teams again and accessing the Outlook API. So we get a nonce, and with that nonce, we can, we can ask for a single sign-on token. So in this case, I'm using row token, and I'm uh, supplying the nonce, and it will get me the, the refresh token credential cookie. So this is not the primary refresh token itself, but it's a derived cookie, which I can use for a single sign-on in Azure AD. So I can pass this to to the road recon tool, and it will authenticate with this cookie. We use the same scope and the same client ID, and I get my access token for Azure AD. And the access token contains all the claims that are applicable. So in this case, we can see this is on a managed device, it's domain joint, and I'm in a known network. So if your primary refresh token contains the MFA claim because you authenticated with MFA on your device, then if you use single sign-on, that MFA claim will also be transferred to this token. So if you have access to a user session on an endpoint, you can use single sign-on and just, just comply with that MFA claim via single sign-on because no one wants to enter their MFA time state. So it's kind of cached in this primary refresh token. The primary refresh token also allows you to do more um, advanced things. And something, some cool stuff is the device state. So you can have a grant which says, I'm only allowing you if you either have MFA or if you have a hybrid Azure AD joint device. And uh, you can require either a compliant device or a hybrid joint device. And compliant means that it's managed by Intune. So this can be a Windows 10 desktop, laptop, or a, a mobile device because you also have Intune for and Android and iOS, and it has to be in line with Intune policies. So this is quite cool because you can specify all the policies in Intune and say what uh, the device has to be comply with, and only if it complies with that, then um, you can get access to these, for example, sensitive applications. So a hybrid deployment is the alternative, and um, then you're joined to Active Directory on-prem and Azure AD at the same time. But the device is primarily managed by, by Active Directory, so via GPOs, as uh, probably all of you will be familiar with. Now, if we use the row token sign-in flow, it will pass a policy that requires conditional, uh, a condition access policy that requires a hybrid device. Why? Because we use the single sign-on token. And the single sign-on token originated from the device and even though we use it on a different device, it's still tied to that device and it will pass policies like this. So you can do this if you have access to an endpoint, but it's not really possible to do this if you are external. So if you are on a non-managed device, even if you have MFA, you won't comply with this policy unless you have access to that endpoint. The fun thing about this is that you, you can get a, so you can use the single sign-on and the primary refresh token to get like a regular refresh token. And these refresh tokens, um, they are valid for quite a long time. If you keep renewing them, they should last uh, pretty long. And I'm just showing that in the screenshot, I'm just using a slightly different version of the Office 65 attack toolkits to visualize that 
with this refresh token that I obtained, I can access the emails. And even if it would require a compliant device, this token con contains that claim that it was from a compliant device and thus it will get me access to that email even from a different machine or even if I lose access to the original endpoint. So there are a few caveats with this, which is uh, regarding the device state. So the primary refresh token is tied to a device. If the device is disabled, the primary refresh token won't work anymore. Refresh tokens, however, they will keep working unless a policy is required that triggers the compliant or hybrid requirement. So if you obtain a refresh token and the device is, uh, is, is disabled in Azure, you can still keep using it, but not on anything that has a policy which requires a compliant or hybrid device. If you refresh the refresh token, then it will re-evaluate the access policies. So if you originally requested them from a trusted IP and then you um, try to refresh it for somewhere else, it might not match the policies anymore and it may deny you for that reason. So a bit of a device for blue teamers. In case of device breach, make sure to change the user's password. Well, it's kind of logical. Disable the device that will disable the uh, primary refresh token and make sure to also revoke any refresh tokens that may already be out there. It's like a, a property you can set that refresh tokens before a certain date aren't valid anymore. So any refresh tokens obtained before the breach will automatically be invalidated. Now, this is all possible as a regular user. So you can do single sign-on from just a user session. There are a few theoretical observations that I had after this research. If you are an admin and you can access anything on the host, so if you have system access, for example, it should in theory be possible to extract the primary refresh token if it's not stored in the TPM. And maybe there are also techniques to uh, interact with the refresh token even if it's stored in a TPM and you can't access the secret material. And lastly, uh, maybe we could fake a device registration and obtain a primary refresh token that way. So this kind of developed and a few people also started looking into this. And I did some research in combination with uh, Benjamin Delphi, the author of Mimikatz, uh, which resulted in a combination of Mimikatz and Road tools, which can be used to um, get the primary refresh token from memory and then use that. So we see here some Mimikatz magic. It dumps LSAS and instead of dumping the regular credentials, it uh, dumps the primary refresh token. And we can use that with secret material to authenticate, even if it's on the from of the device. So this works in case the device does not have a TPM. If it does have a TPM, then we can't obtain the secret material for this refresh token. Uh, we can still get the, tok the, the token itself, but not the material necessary to sign uh, to create our sign-ins. But as we looked at it, we noticed something interesting. So we know that there is some interaction between LSS and the TPM because the secret material is in the TPM. And we also noticed that LSS basically talks to the TPM, provides the TPM with a context, and the TPM then gives back a derived key. And that derived key is used to actually sign the refresh token and prove that we have it in our possession. So an interesting observation here is that the context goes into the TPM and a derived key comes out of the TPM. The context, however, it's just a random yield generated value. It's, it's, it's kind of a nonce to prevent, to prevent replay attacks, but it's not something that's actually provided by, by Azure. So if we are as an attacker on this part, we can just send a lot of random contexts and then get the derived key back. And we can use we can store this somewhere, and whenever we want to sign our primary refresh token, we can just use one of the derived keys with the correct context and, and still sign our sign-ins even without access to the device anymore. So this is some of the magic in Mimikatz. 
it gives you a context and it gives you a derived key. And then you can pass those to um, actually re-sign an already expired primary refresh token cookie. And um, Road Recon will automatically identify, okay, this, two, this, uh, this, this cookie contains the refresh token, but it's not valid anymore. But I have the key material to create a new valid token. And then it will authenticate. So the too long didn't read version. If you're an admin on a device with a primary refresh token, you can steal it. If it's on the TPM, you can still acquire the material which allows you to use it off the device. And also interesting to note that primary refresh tokens and cloud credentials, they're not covered by credential guards. So it will protect on-prem credentials, but it won't protect the Azure AD credentials. And if you want to lead longer version with all the crypto, it's on my blog. Very quickly, last piece about device compliancy. I just wanted to mention this. It's not my own research, and I, but it answers the previous question that I had. Can we actually fake enrollment and create our own compliant device? So there's some awesome research done, done by uh, Dr. Nestori. I'm um, not going to try the last name. He made the AAD internals module, and this allows you to register your own device and also talk with Intune and fake that the device is actually compliant. So how does this work? Just import the PowerShell module, you sign in, and then you get the device in Azure AD. And you can see here, I registered the legit device, Windows 1337, which totally exists. And um, that device is now registered in Azure, which means you can also get and use a primary refresh token. So you just registered your own device, it gets a primary refresh token, and you um, obtain that, and you can use it for, on a different device because it's not actually protected by a TPM. This is kind of an upgrade attack. So registering a device doesn't actually require MFA by default, but it does allow you to upgrade password-only access to compliant device access. And policies often require, for example, either MFA or a compliant device. And if you get a compliant device without needing MFA, then you can still comply with those policies. So to end up with some recommendations for the blue team, I do think you should worry about the other stuff first. So make sure that you have MFA enabled and that your policies are strict enough. And uh, then you can start worrying about people obtaining access to your endpoints and abusing SSO and registering devices. So we see really a movement here that the endpoint is becoming more and more important because you have to protect this because it contains all your secret access material. You can actually restrict who can join or register devices, so definitely do that. And you can also set a requirement to, that you need MFA to register a device, which is also not fully foolproof, but it's, it at least adds another barrier. And if you have the capability, uh, try to monitor for strange device joins that you don't expect from a user. So some closing thoughts. Condition access is tricky. You should try to specify policies as broad as possible and really try to only limit the exceptions and not try to make a different policy for each app because then you can really miss things. And uh, attackers can easily enumerate this and try to bypass it. Uh, so try to understand what each policy does and what is the risk of each exception. And even if your policies are not perfect, conditional access is still a great tool for monitoring weird bypass attempts and acting early on that. Because even if you have a policy which is eventually bypassed and you see five field authentications and one successful, that should be enough to act on. So with about 10 seconds left, this was it. I'll answer any questions later. And uh, thank you all for attending. Thank you so much, Dirk Jan. That was amazing. Uh, such a great talk. <laughs> no, I, I, I think that um, the, the whole idea of, of attacking a, a system and then using that PRT to pivot to the cloud, like it's such a thing that's more and more uh, that we're looking at, right? Because you know, as, as attackers, 
I, you know, historically, I think we tried to hit cloud resources directly to get internal access, but now more and more companies are just storing the data we want in, cl- in, in the cloud. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, yeah. And still, there's so, still so much external attacking going on. But once we're over that, hopefully, then this will become really important and it's back to defend the endpoint to make sure that they don't abuse that. Mm-hmm.